but we at DOA are privileged and pleased to have terrific, terrific staff. Uh, I want to thank uh, both for this webinar. I want to thank Alan and uh, Natalie Lazaroff for helping to coordinate. Uh, we're going to have some show and tell a couple points during this uh, webinar, and I thank them very much for helping. We have a very, very strong and robust audience with us tonight. Uh, it's obviously an important topic, and, and we love the fact that our ZOA friends, uh, board members, and contributors are so interested. Um, I also want to just comment on our webinars that uh, the pandemic has been obviously very unfortunate uh, for so many of us. There have been, unfortunately, a lot of the loss of lives and, and people sick and, and in the economy, you know, really affected. Uh, but, but through this uh, ZOA, we, we have really increased what we've done in terms of education and webinars and the responses we've gotten to this have been overwhelming. And so we will be continuing this once we get back to the office. Some of us are in our offices already. Others of us that will be migrating back over the next few months. Uh, what we've learned through this pandemic, we will be putting to use in terms of uh, educating and, and collaborating with so many of our terrific friends, supporters, and uh, contributors. So thank you again for being here tonight. Uh, we anticipate this will last around an hour. We'll probably go over a few minutes because we started a few minutes late. Uh, and, and obviously, when we hit the bewitching hour, those that feel they want to head off, please feel free to head off. Um, this is really a momentous time. Uh, ZOA, uh, and of course, more Klein, but, but ZOA is the organization. We've been very, very instrumental in some very significant things that have happened over the last few years. You no doubt have heard about ZOA's effort and work uh, to help get the embassy moved to Jerusalem and for Jerusalem to be recognized by this administration as the undivided capital of the Jewish people. Uh, ZOA worked on that for many, many years. Uh, we worked on for less years, but with the same good result, uh, the Golan Heights recognition by our administration, the Trump administration, the U.S.'s administration, and there are also many other items of, of prominence and note that ZOA supported very strongly uh, relative to the Palestinian Authority, the funding, limiting some of these horrific, horrific U.N. Uh, agencies and, and, and commissions, and you know, and now we're coming up to something also very significant. ZOA played a very, very important role in the World Zionist Congress elections and the ZOA coalition of 27 of the strongest pro-Israel organizations. Uh, and, and Alan and Natalie, who are on this call, as well as Liz Burney, who I hope is watching this, uh, were instrumental in, in, in the effort uh, that went on. Liz and I were actually involved in this for six to nine months, if not more. And it was a tremendous effort by ZOA. And we not only broadened our reach and, and expanded the votes and, and doubled our delegates, but more importantly, we established a whole series of new incredible relationships, including we have a new Russian division of the ZOA. Uh, Mort and I have talked extensively about ex expanding and extending our outreach with conservative groups that you know, really have the same views as us on matters relating to Israel and, and national security. So it was an effort that was well worth it. Uh, Alan and Natalie, and as I said before, Liz, and, and a lot of other staff were instrumental in that effort. And as we head toward the uh, World Zionist uh, Congress, which uh, is technically scheduled to occur in October, because of, but because of the pandemic will likely be delayed out, uh, still under discussion is when the delegates will be seated. But it really was a tremendous, tremendous effort by ZOA and all the work and hard effort of everyone and really how this organization has really developed over the years, you know, with Mort's leadership and all the other fine folks have been involved. It's just really been a, a, a credit and a tribute and, and a pleasure to work, you know, with everyone. So we have this year, so far, we have our World Zionist Congress results under our belt. And we immediately turn to that, to other items and really front and center on the plate is the issue of sovereignty and sovereignty now. Um, we're going to hear a lot from Mort tonight. He, he has been speaking out about this extensively. Uh, we're going to go through a series of, of questions and answers. I'll pose the questions. Mort will do you know, much of the talking and, and, and spelling out ZOA's view on this. And, and we hope to leave a little bit of time at the end for some questions uh, by folks, either by chat 
or from uh, uh, the questions that have been compiled beforehand. So as we get started, I just want to mention that for those of you, and, and ZOA welcomes people of all religious flavors and stripes, but for those of you who were either in Shul and Shabbat or read the Parsha Shlach Lecha, it's a very, very relevant Parsha to what we are talking about. As you may recall, Shalach starts off, talks about the 12 spies that were uh, uh, set, were designated, one from each tribe, to go out and scout the land of Israel. Called it Canaan back then, I guess. But they were sent out to scout the land. And as we all know, two heroes, two spies, Yoshua ben Nun, Joshua the son of Nun, and Kalev ben Yifuna, Kalev the son of Yifuna, they were the two spies that spoke out for Israel and were not for them the 10 bad spies that did not give a good report, we wouldn't be here talking today, I doubt, about sovereignty for Israel now. So it's always important to remember that as ZOA gets attacked and there are those that don't support our views and those that have the, their own thoughts about our positions, et cetera, you know, we have a history in not only the Bible, but Jewish history, that we, we don't often have majorities that kind of point the right way on things. When we left uh, Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, they say, the Mishnah tells us, that only 20% of the Jews left. I wasn't around then, so I don't know if that's true, but I accept that as, as true. And we also know that, frankly, on many of the positions that ZOA has, has led and taken the right and correct position, we often <coughs> have had not a lot of supporters and partners with us. Yet, whether it was Oslo or Gaza or so many other things, in the end, we unfortunately turned out to be correct on these issues. So we're going to have a lot to discuss tonight. That was the Parsha last week. And uh, many of you may have uh, seen, it was, uh, it was effectively breaking news today uh, in the Jerusalem Post. Some of us knew about it before. Ambassador David Friedman is here in the U.S. He's going to be meeting, uh, they say, tomorrow at the White House with the other members of the Trump administration and the, the Trump peace plan. Uh, the article that many of us saw right before this uh, webinar suggests the president is actually gonna join that uh, a meeting, at least for part of it. And, and we know in Israel, this is extremely important and it is really at the heart of some very sensitive and significant government deliberations right now. So as I lead up to my first question to Mort, uh, we are going to have a couple of show and tells for you. We are extremely proud, and we'll get to it a little bit later, but we have a very significant campaign that is well beyond, beyond this webinar and well beyond, you know, Mort's interviews and multiple media outlets and, and, and other places. We are spending, frankly, a lot of money on this campaign, and we, we took out two billboards. And in Israel, billboards are not street highway billboards like we have in the U.S., the best billboards in Israel, especially during election times, are on buildings where they basically put a poster that runs the length of the building. So we are so pleased and proud later on to show you. And in fact, let's do it now. Nancy and Natalie, can we, can we put it up now? Are we in a position to put it up now? I want to show everyone the two billboards that showed up this morning in Yushalayim, in Jerusalem, in the heart of the government se section on Sterot uh, Yitzchak Rabin. Look at those beautiful, beautiful billboards. On Sterot Yitzchak Rabin over the Begin Highway. So we have it in English and Hebrew. Hopefully you can read it. In English it says ZOA, it says Zionist Organization of America uh, underneath. Sovereignty now. America stands with Israel at this historic moment. And you see the array of historical figures that are there. We believe if uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu can carry through with his plans, the sovereignty now, we believe he will ultimately be recognized not by many of us, but by really, you know, world history as having served as, as a historic, historic leader of the Jewish state of Israel. And of course, in Hebrew on the right, the other billboard effectively says the same thing. The word for sovereignty in Hebrew is shorter than the word in English, so it made it easier to get in the billboard. And we're really very, very excited about this. We're also very excited for those that don't know. We have a new uh, head of our Israel office, Dan Luz. He's a young, dynamic uh, uh, Israeli now, or originally from Canada, 
and he's worked for uh, a couple of uh, Israeli politicians, and he's a terrific young man who's been working with us on this, and he's very helpful in helping to coordinate that, and we have others as well, Mort, of course. Uh, we have uh, Dan Pollock in Washington. We have Natalie, we have um, uh, myself, we have um, uh, some external people that are helping us as well. And we have a, uh, Liz Burney, we have a significant crew of people that are working on this terrific, terrific campaign, which needs to be successful. We not only want to be successful, it has to be successful. It's a critical time in our history. We don't have this opportunity very often. And we feel it's ZOA's job, our job and your job to spread the word and explain the importance. So Mort, let me turn to you. We have a series of questions. Let me ask you the first question. Okay, what are ZOA's goals here? What are the challenges ZOA and those that are pushing for sovereignty facing? And most importantly, tell our friends on this webinar, tell our audience about some of the pressure ZOA is facing on this issue, including from those to the right of ZOA. <laughs> well, uh, we really should talk about why sovereignty is the, is the right thing to do, but in terms of some of the pressures, <clears throat> uh, I was just speaking to Ambassador Friedman this week, and he told me he was astonished that uh, virtually no Jewish groups around the world, I'm sorry to say, have publicly supported sovereignty. They're all afraid of uh, the reaction from the Arabs, from the Euro European Union, <laughs> Uh, ZOA was the first major group to come out in support. I'm happy to say that today, uh, National Council of Young Israel came out in support. <clears throat> the Republican Jewish Coalition have come out in support. But APAC uh, has refused to come out in support and it is reported that they actually told members of Congress, it's okay to criticize the sovereignty issue. This is APAC who always claims that they will support the policies of the democratically elected government of Israel. And here we have policies supported by the US government and the Israeli government, and APAC is AWOL, nowhere to be found, they're saying nothing. Uh, ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, has actually come out with ads, along with J Street, the extremist anti-Israel group, and the reform movement, and other extremist groups like If Not Now, uh, publicly condemning uh, the sovereignty uh, possibilities, uh, and uh, the other groups have really refused to come out publicly. So. Uh, We've pleaded with the Conference of Presidents, the Umbrella Group, to come out and support. At this point, they have not. Uh, so uh, this is really uh, 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 very, very troubling. And uh, <coughs> the reasons they should be coming out in support of sovereignty is there's really been a century-long injustice to the Jewish people with respect to sovereignty of Judea and Samaria, the Jordan Valley, and that whole area. And in fact, I say a century. <laughs> It's really thousands of years injustice because of those who believe in the Bible, God gave this land to the Jewish people. In fact, that's, that's why it's called the promised land. Who promised it to whom? It's God promised it to the Jews. That's why it's called the promised land. <laughs> and a century ago, uh, there was uh, the, the Balfour Declaration, which gave this land to the Jews. It was controlled by England. They, uh, 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 put out a Balfour Declaration to give the stand to the Jews. There were a number of legal uh, of laws uh, put out, the Sam Remo re uh, Resolution, uh, the British Mandate for Palestine, and the UN Charter, uh, Article 80, which all of which stated clearly that all of the land of Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley and Israel today is Israeli land. In 1922, uh, they temporarily, it became permanent, gave 80% of original Palestine. Original Palestine is all of Judea and Samaria, Israel proper, the Jordan Valley, and Jordan. That was all Palestine. 80% was given away to Transjordan, which is today Jordan. There's only 20% left of Palestine. <laughs> so uh, for those who say, let's split up Palestine, 80% uh, has already been given away to the Arabs. So uh, under international law, uh, the Jews have an absolute right uh, to this land. There's not a single law against it. <laughs> It's also important for security reasons. If Israel controls this part of Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley, they can protect themselves by themselves. If they give this up, 
Israel would be nine miles wide and would be uh, in a very dangerous situation where Israel would not be able to defend themselves. <laughs> That's why a thousand IDF officials and officers, 1,000 have said Israel must uh, declare sovereignty over these areas. And something people don't realize, 500,000 Jews already live there. 500,000 Jews. They're under military law, um, Ottoman law, administrative law, not Israeli law. We need to declare sovereignty so these 500,000 Jews will have a normal life and we'll, we'll know they have a future, that uh, they're not going to be thrown out of their homes. And of course, Jewish history says that the Jews have a right to this land. We are from Judea. We are called Jews because we're from Judea. Most of the Arabs are from Arabia and North uh, Africa. There was never, ever a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria. There's never, ever been any Palestinian kings or queens. In fact, the word Palestine till the late 60s meant the Israeli homeland. A Palestinian meant a Jew until the media and the Arabs uh, had a campaign to make people believe that Palestinian means uh, an Arab. <laughs> And this a land of Judea and Samaria that we support Israel declaring sovereignty over, this is where the first Jews, Abraham and Sarah, lived. This is where uh, the Jewish King David was anointed and ruled. This is where the prophet Jacob slept and dreamt. This is where the prophet Joseph is buried. This is where the Ma Maccabees established their base, the Jewish Maccabees. This is where Jewish kingdoms existed for hundreds of years. This is Jewish land, Yehuda and Shamron. So we have history on our side, religion on our side, the law on our side. Also, if we uh, control this, the, these areas that we believe should be declared a sovereign, uh, only Israel will protect the holy sites. For Arabs, for Muslims, Christians, and Jews, the Arabs have a, a history of destroying uh, non-Muslim holy sites. And uh, uh, it's also important to understand that we have an opportunity now. We have a president of the United States, Donald Trump, who supports this. If he is not reelected in November, the new president, if it's Joe Biden, has made it quite clear he will not support this. So the time is now, not later. And for those who say that uh, this will harm the chances for peace, that is ridiculous. For 27 years since Oslo began, uh, Israel never declared sovereignty over these areas, and there's been no peace. In fact, there's been no peace since 1948 when Israel was established, even though Israel did not declare sovereignty uh, over these areas, because the issue is not sovereignty over this 30% of Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley. The issue is the Arabs will not accept Israel within any borders. Their goal is Israel's destruction. <laughs> That's why there has been no peace, and the polls in Israel are so overwhelmingly the Jews of Israel support this. And uh, Mark mentioned the uh, World Zionist Congress vote. 120,000 Jews voted. 52% of them voted for right of center or Jewish organizations, many of which publicly declared their support for sovereignty. So American Jews support it, Israeli Jews support it, and it's important uh, to get this done now. Now, there have been complaints that this will upset the Arabs and will upset Europe because they've been screaming uh, that you know, they'll break relations with Israel. This will, this will end the chances for peace. I can tell you, I spoke to a major, major Israeli official today. <laughs> you would all know his name. And he told me behind the scenes, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, and Jordan, <laughs> give tacit approval to Israel declaring sovereignty, especially Jordan wants Israel to, to uh, maintain control over the Jordan Valley. It protects uh, the Jordanians, so there really is support. And Europe, no matter what they're saying, uh, needs the spectacular uh, high-tech uh, uh, products that Israel has developed, world-class products. They will not end relations with Israel. They need the, the uh, products that Israel uh, creates. So there's really no reason not to move forward. And it's important to move forward now while we have a president who supports uh, uh, this uh, uh, mandate, supports this move to apply Israeli law over an area where 500,000 Jews already live and 500,000 Jews will not be thrown out of their homes. So this is really a no-brainer. It has to be done. Thank you, Mort. And, and really one of the critical points you mentioned is the 500,000 Jews. The, everyone on this call, I'm, I'm, I'm certain, remembers the, the ripping apart of Israeli society when 8,000, if that was a correct number, that was removed from, from Gaza at the time of that disengagement. 
the concept of 500,000, which really is, you know, 7% of the entire country of trying to remove them. It's just not only horrific, but it's something that could never, never, ever happen. So Natalie, Mort has actually gone through a number of the significant items that are here. I'd like you, if you could, if you could put the 13 points up on the screen, the share screen. Um, we, had, we, we have a number of press releases every week, as most mm -hmm. folks know. We issued, uh, in, in terms of our uh, made, first major press release in this, we set forth 13 reasons why ZOA strongly supports Israel restoring sovereignty over Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley. Mort covered a number of those. These were issued on the press release. If you didn't get it, you don't have it, you lost it, you misplaced it, here it is now. You can email us. We'll send you another version. It's very important. I'm not expecting you know everyone here to know these 13 reasons by heart, but it's important when you uh, are asked the question or you get attacked or you get challenged, you really should have at your fingertips a couple of these points so that you can really uh, help set the record straight for those who were just quoting, you know, baseless and ridiculous uh, arguments on the other side. Uh, in addition to these 13 points, uh, and again, I, I would like to, you know, commend Liz Burney. Uh, if you go in the link on our original press release, we have a, 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 an incredible, uh, lengthy, but incredible backup to all of these points. It's lengthy because it requires it because each of these points in them themselves have backup. We're not making this up. COA isn't making this up. Mort's not just spouting stuff that sounds good. We have backup for each of these points. And if you go on our press release, or if you can't find it, you'll reach out to us. We'll send you the press release, which has these 13 points listed. And then there's a link to our extensive backup that gives specific and more detailed information to each of these. Before we go on uh, further, more, you mentioned a number of these items. If there are any items from this list that you want to talk about a little bit further or think need some further explanation, mm -hmm. you know, we can do that now. More, if you have anything else you want to well, comment on these 13 I, points. I, I wanted to say a couple of things. One, Jordan publicly relinquished their claim <clears throat> to Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley in 1988. <clears throat> so Jordan has no claim. They claim that they state they have no claim. And the Palestinian Authority have, of course, no historic, religious, or legal rights to this area. That's why one of the big mistakes that those opposing this plan, yet they use the phrase, this is annexation of Palestinian territory. It is not annexation, because annexation means you're taking over someone else's sovereign territory. This is no one else's sovereign territory. It never was. It's sovereignty. It's an applying Jewish law. And it's not annexation of Palestinian territory. Because this is not Palestinian territory. There was never a Palestinian state uh, in this area, never any Palestinian kings uh, or, or queens. Uh, and I might add, <laughs> most of the people who are opposing this plan are the same people who said Oslo was going to bring us peace, who said throwing 10,000 Jews at a gas in northern Samaria is going to bring us peace, <laughs> who said, don't you dare move the embassy to Jerusalem. You'll have massive riots. The world will come down in Israel like a ton of bricks. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> so these are people uh, who've been wrong about everything uh, for the past 27 years, and, and they're against sovereignty, and they're wrong uh, again. To listen to these people who are against sovereignty is like going to a lawyer who has never won a case. That's how inappropriate their statements are. Okay, thank you, Mort. Uh, Natalie, we'll leave that up for another minute. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Um, Mort, uh, this campaign, again, we're here for a webinar. We're not, we're not looking to, uh, even as I look at uh, Alan Jay, we're not looking here to you know, raise money here. We're looking to educate. Uh, it is an expensive campaign. Uh, the billboards aren't cheap. Everything else we're doing is not cheap. Uh, we felt this was incredibly important. It's really the essence of what ZOA needs to be about and is about. And so we, we chose, notwithstanding the expense of the, of, of the billboards and other things, we chose to proceed with it. Mort, you've had so many conversations with many of our uh, board members, uh, contributors, friends, people that are not our friends. Okay, but in terms of those that are our contributors and, and our board members, 
Uh, what are they telling you about the sovereignty campaign? What type of encouragement are they giving you? Or if they're not giving you encouragement, <laughs> let, let, let me know what, you know what you'd want to share with our audience about that as well. Well, I can say <laughs> ZOA supporters, ZOA board members, I can't recall a single uh, friend of the ZOA who has called me opposing this. Everyone I've spoken to has supported this campaign. It is the right campaign. It is important that Israel do it now when we have a president who is supporting of this. Uh, if he does, if he, the next president may not. <laughs> so we have really virtually unanimous support. Nobody has called me saying this is a bad idea. You shouldn't uh, uh, do this. Uh, <laughs> I find it astonishing that organizations that call themselves pro-Israel, uh, American Jewish Committee, ADL, APAC, uh, B'nai B'rith, uh, the Orthodox Union, and on and on, why are they silent here? Why aren't they supporting a policy that is important for Israel, historically, religiously, and security-wise, uh, uh, when both governments support this plan? It is really deeply troubling that there isn't more support here in America. In Israel, there's overwhelming support for this plan. Um, so, uh, so, so more, I mean, you, you're out there every day in this issue. You've been on radio shows. You've been quoted elsewhere. Sometimes it's a couple of times a day. Your personal frustration, do you have more frustration? I know folks in this call are interested in this issue. Are you having more frustration with the fact that our natural allies that should be supporting this on the right you know, I know that Young Israel came out today, but we were certainly having many discussions and pushing a lot of organizations. Are you more frustrated that we can't get more public support from organizations, I'll say, on the right of the equation? Or are you more frustrated by the same organizations that were not sure when they ever support Israel because they seem to attack everything? What, uh, what gives you personally more frustration? Well, it's really quite interesting. <laughs> Those on the left are screaming, <laughs> we can't. Uh, do this sovereignty because it will end the possibility of a Palestinian state. Those on the right are saying we can't do this sovereignty because it will create a Palestinian state. It's really quite remarkable. <laughs> they both are, uh, are opposed to this uh, for different reasons, and they're really both wrong. By the way, <laughs> if the Trump plan <laughs> allows Israel to declare sovereignty, right away on these areas. <laughs> a Palestinian state uh, cannot happen unless the Palestinian Authority uh, agrees to change the names of the school, streets, and sports teams that are named after Jew killers, <laughs> changes their curriculum and textbooks which promote hatred and violence against Jews, accepts Israel as a Jewish state, relinquish their phony claim that they want millions of so-called descendants of refuge, so-called refugees, to move into Israel, <laughs> They have to accept all of those and accept the fact there will be a demilitarized state and accept the fact that Israel will have full security control around this entity of the Palestinian Authority. Only if they accept all those things, only then will Israel be required to uh, allow them to have really more uh, autonomy, more sovereignty. Uh, and this was really Rabin's vision. He always said, ultimately, if this works, it'll be less than a state. And uh, you can call this what you want, but even if it happened, and I don't believe the Arabs are ready uh, to do the things I mentioned, oh, by the way, including the Arabs are required, of course, to stop the heinous Nazi-like policy of paying Arabs lifetime pensions if they murder a Jew. And the more Jews they murder, the larger and greater their lifetime pension. It is just breathtaking in its evil. <laughs> so they have to give that up, of course. And... Uh, uh, the odds are that uh, this won't be happening soon, but even if it does, Israel will be surrounding this entity and uh, have full security control. Because the issue is, whatever Israel gives up, they have to be sure they have security control because they're not dealing with Canada or Liechtenstein. They're dealing with an entity uh, that promotes hatred, violence, who've murdered already 2,000 Jews in the last 27 years, maimed 10,000 more. These are a really vicious, violent regime. <laughs> Uh, so, so both sides are really wrong uh, because, uh, in fact, if they would transform their culture and transform their policies, there would be uh, an entity that would be less than the state, uh, 
Uh, so that so the left is wrong and the right is wrong. This does not create a state. They have to do many, many things which they have been thoroughly incapable of doing for the last 27 years, for the last 72 years, uh, when it comes to living in peace with Israel. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, and uh, I'm urging others where I'm talking to people every day to join us and support a sovereignty, uh, applying sovereignty. Bibi Netanyahu clearly, by the way, wants to do this. I, I, I've talked to a number of important officials in Israel. <laughs> he wants to do this. Gantz is more reluctant. His, his deputy, so to speak, the head of the defense, minister of defense. Uh, I do know, after talking to people, Gantz is willing to move towards sovereignty if it's not all 30%, if it's done in stages. So they're negotiating that now. I believe at a minimum, it will be done in stages. I do not believe that nothing will happen. I think something will happen here. And we at ZOA are gonna promote and try to help make this happen uh, while we have a, such a friendly uh, administration, uh, such a friendly administration to Israel. And uh, as Mort says that, we all remember the end of the previous administration with UN Resolution 2334, <laughs> which is one of the worst mm -hmm. things that ever happened to Israel and is still on the books at the UN. Mm -hmm. uh, Mort, uh, over the last many years, um, one of the major critiques or criticisms of the Netanyahu government, which our friends on the left love to refer to as the most extreme right-wing government in the history of Israel, which of course is more than debatable, uh, they would say that the status quo is untenable, that we can't have the status quo, that we have to, we have to move forward with either a two-state solution or who knows what else. So the campaign that began a couple of weeks ago um, on, on the left, which frankly is what really made us realize we had to jump in faster at ZOA than we wanted to here. The campaign that started on the left, a number of, of um, uh, folks that are either pundits or affiliated with think tanks or, or, or you know, a part of the cottage industry that, that deal with the peace process, <laughs> We've been seeing a lot of folks now say, well, we can't do uh, assertion of, we can't, they call it annexation, we call it assertion of sovereignty. They say you can't proceed with, with sovereignty because of all the horribles it's gonna do. We should leave the status quo. Now, all of a sudden, many of these folks are saying, gee, the status quo, what's wrong with the status quo? So what do you say about their argument there, which is really a false argument because for all the time that we suggested up until now that there was nothing you know, that needed to be adjusted and they raised all the horribles about the status quo. What do you think about this switch, this complete mm -hmm. hafuf that's, that's been undertaken by many of these folks that speak on the issue? Well, <laughs> we've had more or less a status quo for 72 years and uh, uh, you know, Israel has survived and thrived with, the, with difficulties, but survived and thrived. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> it is important to apply <laughs> sovereignty now because we want to ensure that it'll become much more difficult later if we apply sovereignty to try and force any of the 500,000 Jews who live there out of their homes. If we do that, if we apply sovereignty, it'll be much more difficult. And they'll send a message to the Arabs, by the way, that if they continue to refuse to negotiate, they've refused to come to the table for 10 years. If they refuse to accept Israel, they're gonna keep losing more and more land. <laughs> so if, if you really are serious about peace, this will actually be an incentive to Palestinian Arabs to come to the table <laughs> and speak for fear that they're gonna lose even more land and make it even less likely that they'll be able to have any sort of significant amount of land if there's a, any deal in the future. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, so I mean, that's why we're, we're supporting sovereignty and that's why, <laughs> but the status quo, quo can continue, but it's bad for the people who live in Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley <laughs> because they're living worried that they'll be thrown out of their homes just like the Jews of Gaza were thrown out of their homes. <laughs> And it's really uh, unfair to them. Uh, and we cannot allow the, the Palestinian Authority to have veto power over applying sovereignty. Israel has the right to, the, the, to apply sovereignty without anyone's permission. <laughs> and as I spoke to a major Israeli official, 
He told me behind the scenes, the, uh, many of the Sunni Arab moderate countries support it. They publicly say they don't because they do this to save face with their populations. But in fact, uh, they say this is a good thing. And by the way, they're becoming less and less interested in the Palestinian Authority. They say that they're really, a, it's a hopeless regime. And uh, there's no becoming less and less beneficial to Arabs to try and support the Palestinian Authority. Mort, um, Jews in this country, uh, we, are in, we are increasingly becoming a less significant percentage of the population. And even within the, the Jewish community, from right to left, the left to right, we certainly have a divide. And, and the number of Jews that support the positions that we do is really not what we think it should be. So we have to rely on friends other than the, and supporters mm -hmm. other than the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And one of the strongest groups mm -hmm. helping to push the uh, agenda of items that ZOA believes in are our Christian evangelical friends. Uh, they've been supportive on so many of the issues that ZOA <laughs> cares about mm -hmm. relating to Israel. In some cases, some of the uh, evangelical uh, uh, movements uh, even may, may go further than, than, than ZOA publicly advocates at, at, on occasion. Um, we haven't heard that much at present from our Christian evangelical friends on the sovereignty issue. Um, we have a lot of folks on this call. This is really one of the largest calls we've had in our, our webinars. And there are a lot of people on this call that have very strong relations with our Christian evangelical friends and, and into those groups. What can we, what can you suggest that our audience and our friends in those communities do to help emphasize to Christian Zionists throughout the United States and elsewhere how important the sovereignty campaign is and that without their support and public pushing of these issues, Mm -hmm. It's really going to be problematical in terms of pushing this forward. Well, I will tell you, uh, I spoke to one of our ZOA's major donors this week who has been speaking to evangelical Christians, Kufi Christians United for Israel. I myself have spoken to several evangelical Christian uh, leaders, <laughs> and I'm pleased to say that yesterday, uh, John Hagee, the head of Christians United for Israel, came out with a very strong statement supporting the right, historic, political, religious right of Israel to declare sovereignty. So the major Christian Zionist group has come out and supported this. And that's very important <laughs> to give Chizu, to give strength to the Jews of Israel, and also to send the message to President Trump, uh, uh, who counts the Christian Zionists among his biggest supporters, to say to President Trump, keep, keep, keep uh, moving in the direction of, uh, of supporting Israel in the declaring sovereignty. <laughs> so uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased about that. And any, uh, any people who have uh, Christian friends, uh, tell them to have their churches send letters to the president, send letters to their members of Congress and members of the Senate and the House <laughs> supporting uh, uh, sovereignty. And remember Israel, no matter what happens, Israel could never give up this portion of Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley in any event, because 500,000 Jews already lived there. So uh, uh, this was a very big uh, uh, push, a plus that uh, John Hagee came out uh, yesterday supporting this sovereignty move. And it's interesting that very few Jewish groups have, and yet this huge Christian group has come out. And why is that? Because first of all, the Christians don't have psychological hangups, worried about the whole world, they're much more psychologically intact and comfortable. <laughs> and also, unlike most Jews, they believe in the Torah. They believe in the Bible. They said, God gave this land to the Jews. End of discussion. That's what they say to me. <laughs> so uh, I'll tell you, that really sends a message that it's sending our kids to day school uh, to learn Torah is a great way to get your kids to become more pro-Israel in their future lives. That's true. And, and Pastor Hagee has often said that and often quoted from Bray Shit. And uh, uh, I, I remember more when we were at the, uh, the Hanukkah party this year, we, we, we ran into uh, Pastor Hagee afterwards. And, and although the pandemic hit, so we didn't make it there, he, he commented to us that his 80th birthday was coming up. Pesach was a, a very important time for him because his 80th birthday was coming up. It was Passover. It coincided with Easter. And his intention before the pandemic was to celebrate all three in Israel. 
and he can talk about every one of his Israel trips and his uh, touring of all parts of, of, of the land of Israel. And to have friends like that is, is very, very important. And it doesn't happen. It happens because they believe, but it also happens when we try to work with them and, and, and push these conversations. So those of you who have those relationships, keep at it. We, we certainly need their support. Well, it's uh, interesting. Go ahead, Mark. I went over to, to Pastor Hagee, and he told me he was going to celebrate his 80th birthday. And uh, he said he can't believe how old he's getting. And I told him the story. Uh, for many years, I worked with the great two-time Nobel Prize winning chemist, Linus Pauling. Uh, I used to be a biostatistician, <laughs> working with him on nutrition and disease. By the way, when I worked in that field, all I got was praise for working to help improve people's health. Uh, now I have a much rougher time. <laughs> so when, when Professor Pauling turned 93, I was telling this to uh, Pastor Hagee, I called up Professor Pauling. And I said, happy birthday, you're gonna be 93 next week. I said, if you could wish for anything, Professor Pauling, on your 93rd birthday, what would you wish for? I'm telling Hagee. And Pauling said, I only wish I was 80 years old again. I felt so great then, now I'm feeling a bit tired. So Hagee loved that, it inspired him that maybe 80 is not so old. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, we, we mentioned before that uh, Ambassador Friedman uh, is in fact in the U.S. now and, and the meeting will take place uh, tomorrow at the White House. Uh, in addition to the 13 points, uh, we had a ZOA editorial in the, Jew, in the Jerusalem Post on, on Sunday, which uh, Mort and I received lots of emails, uh, mostly favorable comments. Some people had their views uh, to the contrary. We'll accept the favorable comments and ignore those that uh, took a different position. Um, but Mort, uh, this meeting will take place tomorrow. If you, what would be your desired result and outcome of that meeting? If you, if you, if you had the opportunity to write the answer as to what should be the two or three sentence result of that meeting or the headline, what would you like to come out of tomorrow's meeting at the White House? Well, at least two things. First of all, obviously, to have the administration publicly reiterate their support for Israel to declare sovereignty over 30% of Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley, uh, where 500,000 Jews live. And secondly, to assure us that they will not allow any of the smaller Jewish communities there to be isolated and, and the roads to be surrounded by Palestinian uh, by future Palestinian territory, because if the roads uh, have on each side a Palestinian territory where Palestinians live, it would endanger the Jews living there. So we hope they'll come out and say, we're going to make sure that any of the smaller communities and the roads uh, will not be isolated and Israel will be given enough land to be able to protect the Jews traveling those roads and protect the isolated uh, uh, enclaves. I know they are working on that. That's what I would hope they would come out uh, and, and, uh, and say. Okay, so Mort, I'm gonna ask one final question of you, and then I have uh, dozens of questions that have come in, either in advance or, or from folks uh, right now. So I'm gonna ask you one last question, then we'll turn to some of the other questions. Uh, if you were gonna have a call with Prime Minister Netanyahu, either this <laughs> evening or tomorrow morning, after our ZOA webinar, what would you say to the Prime Minister? <laughs> uh, first of all, I would remind him that I was one of his father's closest friends. <laughs> ben Sio and his father and I were very close. We spoke literally every week by phone. I would see him uh, three times a year. Every time I came to Israel, I'd spend half a day with him at his home. <laughs> so I, I would remind him of that. And I would remind him that Ben Sion, actually I wrote him a letter only this past week, and I sent it to uh, Ambassador Ron Dermer to make sure he gets it, <laughs> that his father supported Israel uh, 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 applying sovereignty over these areas. He said this to me many, many times to remind him that that's what his father wanted. And Bibi very much wanted his father's respect and, and he had enormous respect for his father. So I would tell him that, <laughs> and I would tell him how important it is <laughs> to keep in her promise to the uh, Israeli people where you said one of your first acts will be applying sovereignty, keep your word. And if you keep your word, then you will go down in history, I would tell him, as one of the giants in Jewish history and Israeli history. You'll be up there with uh, Theodor Herzl and David Ben-Gurion and Menachem Begin 
you will, I will tell them, you would comprise a new Mount Rushmore of Jewish Israeli leaders who have done important things for the state of Israel. <laughs> so uh, despite all the pressures, he's under enormous pressure from Europe, some of the Arab states, many Jewish leaders in America, unfortunately, to not do anything. <laughs> I urge him uh, to follow through and fulfill his promise. And this will be his greatest legacy as the longest serving prime minister of Israel. Thank you. Uh, I would say that we put him, that's why we put him on our billboards that are up there in Yushalayim. We want to remind him of what, what, it, what is going to happen if this, this works <laughs> out correctly. Okay, more thank you. I, I, I'm mindful of the time. It's uh, 7.53. We start a little bit late, so we'll go at least till, till uh, 8.03, 8.05. I want to try to get through a lot of the questions that have come in. So uh, Marty Zukov asked, uh, and some of these we've answered, but we'll give an opportunity for more to add anything supplemental uh, to the questions, which may be a variant to what we asked already. So Marty Zukov asked, are any other pro-Israel organizations besides ZOA actively supporting Israel in its attempt to declare sovereignty over Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria? We certainly talked about the unusual coming out tonight. Are there any other organizations, whether they're small or big or whatever size that you, you, you just want to mention in that regard? Well, the Conference of Presidents have said they're gauging what the consensus might be in the conference to come out. They have not come out supporting it yet. Uh, neither is APAC, neither is AJ committee, and uh, neither have any of the Orthodox groups except National Council of Young Israel. Uh, this is really, I have to say, shameful. I have to say it's shameful. Uh, we're trying to still talk to people, convince them, uh, but at this point, it's just Republican Jewish Coalition, National Council of Young Israel, the Rabbinical Alliance of America, a group of Orthodox rabbis, uh, uh, and the ZOA. Uh, and we're the most I think significant organization that's supporting it. Uh, we're still trying to get others to support this. Uh, if they don't come out supporting sovereignty over an area where a half a million Jews live, they're derelict in their duty and their mission and their commitment to the Jewish people and to the holy land of Israel. Okay, um, we, we had, a lot of us have, have seen the uh, famous or infamous letter that uh, the Democratic members of the House signed, I don't know, a week ago, uh, you know, threatening Israel, mm -hmm. telling them that they can't proceed with asserting mm -hmm. sovereignty. They used the other mm -hmm. A word. We use the asserting sovereignty uh, word. Uh, fortunately, tonight, I think it was tonight, it may have been early this afternoon, as we're about to enter the webinar, we read about a Republican letter from either 116 or 119 members of the House which came out supporting Israel's move to do that. So Karen Frisch actually asked more on the Democratic uh, letter about the letter that was sent by Democratic politicians to stop the sovereignty uh, uh, movement from moving forward. Um, she can't believe uh, that this is going to put, uh, you know, any real crimp in the peace talks with the Palestinians, as you, of course, have commented. Um, she asked, are they so manipulated by the pull to the left that they're coming out with this position. So I don't know if there's anything you want to say on that beyond what you've said already. Uh, <laughs> it's deeply disappointing and disturbing that good Jewish members of the Congress, like Ted Deutsch of Florida, like Ch Chuck Schumer, Benjamin Cardin, uh, uh, have come out against sovereignty, that Bob Menendez, who used to be maybe the greatest friend to Israel in the entire Senate has come out against it. And he's even reversed on the Iran deal now, condemning Trump for ending the Iran deal when he was the leader against the Iran deal. <laughs> and now he, he's, he now supports it. Because unfortunately, their party has moved to the left, to the left, to the left, <laughs> and they're being um, taken with them. <laughs> uh, it's a very d disappointing set of circumstances, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> One of the reasons they're able to get away or feel comfortable opposing sovereignty is because almost no Jewish organizations have supported it. Not APEC, ADL, AJ Committee, B'nai B'rith. Uh, they see this, and so they're not worried. They see the Jews aren't supporting this. So I really blame the Jewish organizational leaders and the Jewish organizations first for creating an environment where these members of Congress can feel comfortable opposing sovereignty. I blame the Jewish organizations first and foremost 
even more than members of Congress. By the way, if you want to learn more about this issue or see the 13 points, if you go to zoa.org, zoa.org, the 13 points are listed on our website. Okay, Mort, um, we're going to try to get through a couple more. Uh, Joseph Flashner, relative to what you just said, um, so we want to give you an opportunity to mm -hmm. comment on it. Joseph Flasher says, are there any prominent Democrats at office offices? <laughs> you know, I, I personally have not seen uh, or heard any of them coming out publicly. There are some good Democrats, certainly, but I haven't heard a word from them. 105 Democrats signed a letter opposing it, led by Ted Deutsch and Nita Lowy, uh, two Jewish people. <laughs> Uh, I would have expected Elliot Engel and Brad Sherman to support this. Maybe they have, but I haven't heard, because they're two of the greatest friends of Israel, Engel and Brad Sherman, but they're very worried about the way the, their party is moving, and they may be uh, concerned about moving that direction. Uh, especially Elliot Engel has a very tough race. His primary is tomorrow, and so he's been uh, nervous about the, being too pro-Israel because of the way the party's going. So I'm, I'm not aware of a single one who's come out publicly. Pelosi, by the way, also condemned sovereignty. <laughs> that, that doesn't surprise me, nor should surprise you, unfortunately. Uh, okay, I, I do have to ask you some of these tough questions that are showing up here, so don't, don't blame the messenger. Um, is ZOA familiar, which of course we are, but is ZOA familiar with the Jordan option in which the Arabs of Judea and <laughs> Samaria, Yehud and Shomron, will continue to be <laughs> citizens of Jordan with residency cards to stay in Judea and Samaria without being citizens of Israel. That comes from Neil Sussman. Mm -hmm. So I, I understand. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's policy. a Jordan op the Jordan option in which Arabs oh, yes. of Judea and Samaria will continue, will be citizens of Jordan <laughs> with residency cards to stay in Yehud and Shomron without being citizens of Israel. Uh, no, that has been discussed over the years that they live what they live. They become citizens of Jordan. Uh, Jordan rejects this because uh, King uh, Abdullah is very worried that many of these uh, Palestinian Arabs uh, uh, might be hostile to him and undermine his regime. So they have not supported this. So as long as he's against this, uh, it can't happen. Uh, it's been talked about for a long time, but it has gone nowhere. Okay, so uh, I've got a couple of questions here, which uh, I was, if I only got one, I would not have asked it, but you know, our good friend Len Getz, another good friend, Laurie Lowenthal Marcus, they both asked questions along the same lines, which are, we're reading so many contradictory reports about in the administration about who's for, who's against, you know, et cetera. Uh, to the extent you feel comfortable talking about who we think is, uh, who we think with, with substance uh, is, is against this in the administration and, and um, you know, what, problems that might present, or mm -hmm. if we just don't know enough to be able to reliably comment on that? I will tell you, <laughs> I've talked to many major officials in the Republican Party, in, in the administration, and more importantly, <laughs> who told me that uh, President Trump and others would be much more strongly publicly supporting sovereignty if they saw Jewish organizations supporting it. They're really in shock that almost no Jewish organization support this. That is what gives them pause to come out more fervently. We have ourselves to blame for the administration not being even stronger in this issue. Remember, this is the Trump plan. It's in the plan, the sovereignty, but they see that, uh, that the major groups, ADL is against it, AJ committee and APAC won't take a position. The conference of presidents have been silent. <laughs> B'nai B'rith, the Orthodox Union, the conservative movement, the reform movement, Rick Jacobs has come out fervently against it. And that's one of the reasons you're not seeing a stronger stance by the administration because they see if the Jews aren't supporting, what do they want? In fact, I was told by one of the people in the White House, uh, Trump says, what do they want from me when you won't even support this? Why should I be putting my neck out supporting this when the Jews themselves are not doing so? So I don't blame the administration. I blame the Jewish leaders and they should be ashamed of themselves uh, for not protecting the lives of 500,000 Jews who live there, not protecting the security of Israel, to maintain the Jordan Valley. Jordan Valley, by the way, left to right in Israel, everybody supports maintaining the Jordan Valley. Uh, so, and Rabin, in his last speech before mm -hmm. Knesset, clearly said mm -hmm. that the Jordan Valley would be less than, it'd be something less than a state, mm -hmm. and with Jordan Valley, 
remaining in, uh, in Israel's hands. So we have a couple of other questions which you've touched upon, but uh, they come from friends, uh, uh, Carl Goldberg, Mindy Stein, some others. They ask, how do you answer the residents in Judea? How do you, how do you give your answer to the, those residents in Judea and Samaria, including some of the mayors who are against this plan because they do not want uh, to state that there is a right for the Palestinians to have a state provided they jump through all the conditions that are set forth in the plan. Look, and we haven't taken a formal position about this, but uh, I would say to them, <laughs> you have one and a half million Arabs who live in Judea and Samaria. That's a fact. Political leaders in Israel have to make a decision. We, who are not political leaders in Israel, we can pontificate and say this, say that, without worrying about consequences. The Prime Minister of Israel has to worry that there are one and a half to two million Arabs there, has to make a decision. <laughs> so they support the Trump plan, <laughs> which could turn out to be a significant autonomous entity for the Palestinian Authority. But that won't happen unless they stop paying Arabs to murder Jews, they stop naming school streets and support teams after Jew killers, accept Israel as a Jewish state, end their demand of descendants of refugees to move into Israel, <laughs> And that hasn't happened in 72 years and longer. So I would just say uh, that the odds are very small they'll ever accept this. Uh, it may be never. But if, in fact, they became a legitimate uh, entity that truly wants to live in peace with, with the Jewish state, uh, then when you have one and a half million Arabs, you have to consider uh, that possibility. Right now, we're very far from that possibility. So I would tell the people who are worried about this leading to a state, uh, you know, do they really think the Palestinian Authority is ready to do all the things required of them? Change the curriculum, change the textbooks. And that was, be, uh, change the entire culture and entire philosophy, going against the Koran, which has uh, enmity toward the Jewish people or a Jewish state. So uh, I, I think uh, this plan, and we oppose the state because right now it would be a terrorist, an Iran, Hamas terrorist state. <laughs> But the odds of that happening is so small that I don't think we should worry about it. And we should declare sovereignty and then see what happens. Okay, I also want to add for everyone's benefit, uh, you may have seen it, you may have forgotten, at the time of the uh, uh, rollout of the Trump peace plan, ZOA did a very exhaustive and comprehensive analysis of that plan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while we support most of it, there are things we may have felt not as strongly about, but more has just stated the legitimate political reasons for considering, uh, if not so much what the alternatives are, but what the pressures are on the government of Israel and the various constituencies and, and the realities. And so if you want to see a, a very, uh, a excellent, excellent analysis of, of the Trump uh, peace plan. Um, you either can go on our ZOA website or email any one of us and we'll get you that link. And it really is, it's, it's not only fascinating reading, but it really explains in detail what, what you don't hear. You know, you hear a sound bite from other organizations, other folks that have their views on it, that our analysis is incredibly complete. Um, we, we have, it's 8.06, so I'm really just going to do uh, two more um, uh, from our good friend, Cheryl Silvermort. Uh, she says, and I just don't know if this is true or not, so you'll, you'll answer what you know. Two very good friends of ours. She says, Senator Ted Cruz, uh, who called you one of the great scientists ever at the convention that we attended. And, uh, uh, okay, in any event, Senator Ted Cruz and, and uh, and or Se Senator Mark Rubio. Have they come out publicly on this yet? Uh, they are both speaking, she tells us, at the Kufi Summit next Tuesday. And, and she also suggests that another good friend of ours who we met with in Israel around the time of the MC opening, Senator Rick Scott, he also will likely be there. To your knowledge of any of these three stalwarts and, and strong supporters of Israel, they come out publicly on this issue yet. Uh, best of my recollection, I think Senator Cruz has come out in support of it, uh, but I've not, I don't recall any of the others. By the way, another great friend of Israel is Senator Tom Cotton. I'm not aware if he's come out with a public statement. <laughs> so that's the most I know right now. Okay. I'm going to answer with one, I'm going to raise the last question, one of my favorite targets and our target. 
Uh, we do not understand the basis on which the EU, the European Union operates, the level of their hypocrisy, and, and I would say tri triple or quadruple standard, not just double standard. And, and I really just think they've become so irrelevant in, in any of these discussions. But uh, uh, Eric Salkov does ask, what do you think EU will do if mm -hmm. sovereignty is, mm -hmm. is put into place, asserted by, by Israel? Nothing. <laughs> Look, <laughs> they are a major purchaser of Israeli cybersecurity, high-tech products. Israel is a, has a world-class industry in high tech, which Europe and the whole world needs. They have to come to Israel to buy these products. They don't have it. They don't make it themselves. The Israeli ingenuity is extraordinary. <laughs> They're screaming and yelling now, but they'll do nothing. Just like they were screaming and yelling about moving the embassy to Jerusalem. And when it happened, nothing happened. <laughs> so I don't think that's a concern. Uh, I don't think there's going to be any rioting. EU will not break relations. They need Israel too badly. The Palestinian Authority will not end security relations because they need Israel's security for themselves to stay in power more than Israel needs their minimal security they offered Israel. <laughs> and as I said, a number of moderate Arab states, I told, talked to a major Israeli official today, behind the scenes are supportive of this sovereignty. So I think this is all overblown and we don't have to worry about a thing. Israel should not allow the Palestinian Authority and Europe to have veto power over holy Jewish land where half a million Jews live. So not worried about that uh, whatsoever. Okay, thank you, Mort. Mort, uh, on behalf of uh, ZOA and behalf of everyone on, on this <laughs> webinar, uh, I want to extend my thanks for your, uh, not always, always being there for us, but really your uh, clarifying, your laying out, your setting <laughs> forth not only ZOA's vision, your vision, the correct vision, and, and really educating and informing those in this webinar. So more, I, I do wanna thank you very much on behalf of ZOA and those participating. <laughs> to those that are participating, um, I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. Uh, this is really, we are so, as I said before, so enthused about these webinars during this pandemic. And although this is webinar and it's not uh, you know a fundraising hour, uh, again, this, this campaign the sovereignty campaign is, is not an inexpensive proposition. The ZOA, we very, very willingly and, and, and enthusiastically uh, have taken this on full force without going out to our major contributors. We said we've got to proceed with the billboards. We saw what was happening on the left, all the articles that were being planted, all the other stuff that was out there. We knew we had to proceed there. And, and we said, we'll figure it out later. So mm -hmm. for those of you who, who are supportive of this and have the capacity, uh, I would certainly encourage you to try to help us out on this. Uh, if, if you're not there, obviously that's everyone's individual decision. Uh, we need to go forward with this campaign and we will go forward with this campaign. Uh, we wanna thank you very much for participating in this and watching this tonight. And uh, Mort has one more item he wants to say, so I will allow him to say that before we take leave well, of you. Mort. Well, first of all, I want to urge everyone who are not members of ZOA, join ZOA, strengthen our numbers, strengthen our resources, go to ZOA.org, join ZOA to help us. If you agree with our message, I want none of you to enjoy our message and our work unless you're a member. Uh, it, it, we're in this together. We're using ZOA to promote our uh, holy agenda. I want to thank Natalie and Alan for being so critically helpful in putting this webinar together. I want to thank Liz Burney for her brilliant and extraordinary work in helping uh, marshal all of the facts and the data. So we are well equipped to uh, uh, answer any questions and, uh, and put out our materials. And I want to thank you, Mark, uh, for asking important questions and filling in gaps that I missed with really your own wonderful insights and own extraordinary knowledge, even though I understand you have another full-time job that you have to deal with. So uh, very impressive, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Again, we, we thank you all for uh, participating in this. We're gonna continue with these webinars. We're gonna continue with our message and we're not gonna stop. So thank you all for being with us tonight and, and uh, I wish you all a good night. Thank you. Thank you.